this evening we'll be in the book of Hosea. And for the next several weeks, we'll be doing a series of sermons in the book of Hosea. And we'll be doing this every Sunday night, every Sunday night. And so this evening, what I would like to do is give an overview of the book of Hosea and talk about the unfaithful wife and the faithful husband. The unfaithful wife and the faithful husband. Now let's give some introductory material from the book of Hosea. The Hebrew name Hosea means salvation or deliverance. Hosea was a man that preached in the northern kingdom and he prophesied during the reign of Jeroboam, the second king of Israel, and during the time of Uzziah, Jotham, Uzzah, and Hezekiah, the four kings of Judah, which would have been around 750 B.C., now, the theme and the message of this book, the first part of the book, Hosea's life is made symbolic of the, the, the message he received from the Lord concerning his people. God's love for a faithless nation is shown through Hosea's marriage with Gomer. Now, Hosea reveals God's great love and concern for uh, his people to live faithfully. Throughout this book, God desires to have his people turn back to him and away from idolatry. Now, as we go throughout this book, we will witness God's plea for his people to live up to the covenant he had made with them. But the second half of the book gives us great details of Israel's involvement with the Canaanite religion. Like other prophetic books, Hosea carries a call to repentance. The call is that they forsake their idols and return to the Lord and live faithfully. Now throughout Hosea's ministry, let me tell you, he witnessed Israel's sin and their spiritual adultery. He saw sin in its ugliest form. But before we get into the lesson tonight, let me add that this book is relevant for us today as spiritual Israel. It truly is. Just as God wanted Israel to be faithful, he wants us to be faithful to him today as well. We need to understand, my friends, that unfaithfulness not only violates God's law, but it breaks his heart. It pains him to see his children unfaithful to him and not holding to the covenant that was made. And so as we read and study through the book of Hosea for the next couple of Sundays, may we give heed to being faithful to God in an unfaithful world. Now, this evening, like I mentioned, we'll do an overview of the book. We'll discuss the symbolic marriage, uh, Israel's unfaithfulness, and how God desired to have his people back. The first point I want to look at this morning is the symbolic marriage in chapter 1, verses 2 through 9. Open up your Bibles to Hosea chapter 1, and we'll look at verses 1 through 9. I'm going to do something different. If I can get someone to read verses 1 through 9 for me, Hosea chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Right, right. 
All right here, so we have Hosea's marriage to Gomer, and I appreciate you reading that for us, Milton, verses one through nine. Now God told Hosea, go take uh, to yourself a wife of harlotry and have children of harlotry, for the land commits flagrant harlotry, forsaking the Lord. Now some people may think, wow, God is really asking a prophet here to go take up for yourself a harlot, if you will, or a prostitute, for example. But you see what we're reading here, my friends, there's more to it than God asking Hosea here to take up a wife who's a harlot. There's a lot of symbolic messages going on throughout this book. What God is wanting the children of Israel to see is that this marriage between Hosea and Gomer is the covenant. But in this book, Hosea represents God and Gomer, who's unfaithful, represents the children of Israel. So here's the imagery for you. God stand, Hosea stands for God, and we know that God is compassionate. We know that he is long-suffering, but Gomer stands for the nation of Israel, a nation that is unfaithful to Jehovah God, a nation that is subjected to the influences and idolatry and immorality. She was unfaithful to Hosea, and this caused him great sorrow, just as Israel's unfaithfulness to God hurt him. But we know that the Lord is compassionate and he is merciful. But because of her unfaithfulness, because of their unfaithfulness, it's brought about compassion in God. And we'll get to that a little later this evening. We see the redeeming and the chastising and the restoring of Gomer in chapter 3 and verse number 3. Now, the children that were mentioned here in this passage represents the individual Jews. Now, when you look at verses three through nine, we are told that Gomer conceived three children during their marriage. All three children were given names and these names had meaning behind them. So when you look at the first name, the child was named Jezreel. Now this name symbolized Israel's punishment. Notice what verses four and five says here. The Lord said to him, name him Jezreel for yet a little while and I will punish the house of Jehu for the bloodshed of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel on the day I will break the bow of the kingdom of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Now, Jehu was a king of Israel who was commissioned by God to eliminate Ahab and Jezebel in 2 Kings chapter 9, verses 7 through 8. Did he do it? Yes, he did, if you turn over there and look at the passage. But in 2 Kings chapter 10, in verse number 30, the Lord had blessed his family. Turn over to 2 Kings and look at chapter 10 and verse 30. I want us to start in verse number 28 and we'll read to 30. 2 Kings chapter 10, 28 through 30. Just to give us a little context of Jehu. Thus Jehu eradicated Baal out of Israel. However, as for the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel sin, from these Jehu did not depart even the golden calves that were at Bethel and that were at Dan. The Lord said to Jehu, because you have done well in executing what is right in my eyes and have done to the house of Ahab according to all that was in my heart, your sons of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. But look at verse number 31 here. Because I want you to notice in Hosea where it says, yet for a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the bloodshed of Jezreel. Well, in verse number 31 here, but Jehu was not careful to walk in the laws according to the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. He did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, which he had made Israel sin. This is why God said he would punish the house of Jehu, the bloodshed of Je Jezreel, and he will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel because Jehu had caused Jezreel to sin. 
Now, Jehu didn't fully take heed to what God had asked of him to do. Uh, he went beyond what God had commanded him to do and his bloodthirsty attitude and his unfaithfulness, if you will, and his ways of not keeping with the commandments of God and causing Israel to sin is what would lead to the bloodshed of Jezreel. Now, one commentator here said that his motives were not right. He only wanted to do what he wanted to do and not fully complete what God had asked him to do. Now, the name of Jezreel here also meant that God would put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel, like we mentioned before. Therefore, God said, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley. And in other words, what he is saying here is that Israel will one day experience God's power and his wrath. Now, when you look at the second child, the name here was lo Rahema, which means that God will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel. He will no longer feel sorrow for the misfortune of Israel. Why? Well, because Israel continued to bring spiritual calamity upon themselves. If you look at Hosea chapter 4 and verse number 4, the Bible tells us that their deeds will not allow them to return to their God. For a spirit of harlotry is within them, and they do not know the Lord. But then when it comes to the third child that was named Lohami, or Lohami, the, lo the, the meaning of this child's name signifies that the Lord that Israel was not his people and God was not their Lord. Now in this marriage or covenant, if you will, between Hosea and Gomer, she did not remain true to their marriage vows. The unfaithful wife of Israel deserted her faithful husband, Hosea, which symbolizes God. And the unfaithful nation had turned their backs on a faithful God who delivered them from Egypt. You know, as a matter of fact, the three children epitomized the message that God conveyed through Hosea. Notice the three names here. Once again, Jezreel means the people would be judged and punished. Lo Rahema, God would no longer have compassion on Israel simply because they would give themselves over to idolatry. And Lo Hami, God would reject Israel, which is the result that would no longer be his people and he would no longer be their God simply because they were giving themselves over to the idols that were amongst them. Now, folks, we see this today in the Lord's church. Christians backsliding and giving themselves uh, over to sin and turning their backs on God. so infatuated with the world around them that they become influenced by the world's way of living and thinking, just as Israel was here in this context. God is faithful. Yet, we can be unfaithful to him in service and in word. And we're no longer focused on God, but rather focused on ourselves. You see, when James is writing to the Christians in James chapter four and verse number four, he specifically says, you idolaters, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who wants to make themselves a friend of the world makes themselves an enemy of God. He is writing to Christians. Because there were Christians during that time who wanted to be friends with the world rather than being in fellowship and right standing with God. You see, for the Christian that is willing to give themselves over to sin, the Bible clearly states you are an enemy of God. And when we do this, let me tell you, we are committing spiritual adultery. Now let's look at Israel's unfaithfulness to God going back to Hosea, some of the sins that were committed during this time. No knowledge of God in the land, the Bible tells us in chapter four and verse one. Look at verses four, chapter four, verses one through two. Listen to the word of the Lord, O sons of Israel. For the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land because there is no faithfulness or kindness, or no knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing deception, murder, 
stealing and adultery. They employ violence so that bloodshed follows bloodshed. That was going on amongst God's people. Look at verse six. God says, my people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I also will reject you for from being my priest. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. Now, how is it that a nation like Israel could forget about God and after, after he had brought them out of slavery? How could you turn your back on God after he brought you out of Egyptian captivity? He has been faithful, loyal, and yet, we see the children of Israel here in the context of Hosea, unfaithful to God. In their deeds and in their acts, so unfaithful that they are forgetful of the things that God has done for them in their lives. But like I mentioned before, we see this today. God has been truly faithful to us, yet we are unfaithful to him in so many ways. God has given himself completely over to us. He has given his son for, uh, for us so that we could strive to live holy and blameless lives, yet we do the complete opposite. Yet we have step, if you will. Yet we straddle the fence. We're not truly faithful and committed to God as we should be, yet he is faithful to us in this covenant. Just as Hosea was faithful to Gomer. But let's look at some more of their sins. Their love for God was unstable. Unstable love. In Hosea chapter six and verse number four it says, for your loyalty is like a morning cloud and like the dew which goes away early. You see, God seeks stable love from his children. Does he not? God seeks committed love. Love that is consistent with doing his will. I want you to notice here, the Lord says, for I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifices and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. What is God saying there? He delights in loyalty. He delights in consistent love from us as his children. You know, I think about when we come in for worship every morning, when we come before God, and if our hearts are not right, if we're not loyal to him throughout the week, those sacrifices and the things that we're doing and the offering that we're putting in doesn't mean anything because we're not loyal to him. But let's look at some, some more of their sins. It says that they deeply uh, corrupted themselves Chapter nine and verse number nine. Literally, they gave themselves over to wickedness. You know, Isaiah chapter four and verse number 10 say that they will play the harlot, but not increase because they have stopped giving heed to the Lord. Isaiah four and verse 12 says, for a spirit of harlotry was, has led them astray. And they have played the harlot departing from their God. Spiritual adultery will lead you away from God. Friendship with this world will lead you away from God. Giving yourselves over to the world will lead you away from God. But you see, the people also here were backsliding, if you will. It had, it had, uh, had become a habit for them. Verse, uh, chapter 11 and verse number seven says, my people are bent on turning from me. They keep falling back into idolatry and immorality and men were perishing because of their wicked counsels. Yet God still, my friends, loved the unfaithful nation and he longed to save them. 11, eight through nine, but they kept on going their way of, of living and sin had completely blinded them. 
backsliding had become a habit for the children of Israel in the context of Hosea to the point to where they were blinded by sin. They couldn't even turn back because they were so infatuated, so in love with idolatry and what the surrounding nations were offering and putting before them that they couldn't even see God. But like I mentioned before, we see that today. We see it today. People in love with money to the point to where they can't even see God. People so in love with possessions and material things that they can't even see God. So in love with the income that they make at work that they can't even come to church to worship God. We see that today. So in love with money that they withhold from giving what they should be given to God, if you know what I mean. So in love with money that they would rather shorten God when it comes to giving on Sunday, that they would rather save and accumulate as much as possible because they have a greed for wealth. And it blinds them. But some other sins that were committed here was widespread idolatry. You see, Israel was told as a nation not to make alliances with other nations. Why? Because God knows that bad company corrupts good morals. Now, when they entered the land of Canaan, they were deceived and Baal became their God. Baal was worshiped by the Canaanites as the sun God and as the storm God. He was revered by many in the land as deity. And Israel followed suit. They followed suit and they worshiped this false God. They worshiped him. They offered sacrifices to this God and other idols, and God was hurt behind their idolatry. And they sinned more and more and have made them molten images of silver, even idols according to their own understanding, Hosea 13 and verse number two. That's what happens when an individual is unfaithful to God. They forget quickly what God has done for them. They, they lose their love for God. They become deeply infatuated with, with the world. They start to backslide and they give themselves over to idolatry. But you see, these sins were Israel's downfall, which led them to ruin. They were so unfaithful to a loving God who cared for them. But it always amazes me that when I look at this, this book, that God still yearned for his people. In other words, God wanted his children back. He desired to have them back. If you open up and look at chapter 11, verses one through four. Chapter 11 of Hosea, verses one through four. After all that Israel had done, God still desired to have them back. Isaiah chapter 11, verses one through four. When Israel was a youth, I loved him. Out of Egypt, I called my son. The more they called them, the more they went from them. They kept sacrificing to balls and burning incense to idols. Yet it is I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them in my, name, in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of a man with bonds of love. And I became to them as one who lifts the yoke from their jaws. And I bent down and fed them. So God is reminding the children here that I loved you so much that I brought you out of captivity. I brought you out of slavery. I taught you how to walk. Yet, you're gonna be unfaithful to me. Yet, you're gonna give yourself over to idolatry and wickedness. Look at nine through 11. 
because he relented his punishment upon them if they were to repent. You see, if Israel were to repent and turn away from idolatry and, and the things like that, he was going to relent once again with the hope of them returning home. Verses 9 through 11 says, I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not destroy Ephraim again, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst. I will not come in wrath, and they will walk after the Lord. He will roar like a lion, indeed he will roar, and as his sons will come trembling from the west, they will come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria. And I will say to them in their houses, declares the Lord. Folks, God is the same today, yesterday, and forever. He yearns over his people. He desires to have his people. He doesn't want his people to be unfaithful to him. He doesn't want his people, his children, to give themselves over to idolatry. He doesn't want his people to give themselves over to wickedness and to sin once they've been called out of darkness into his light. That's why he sent his son to die. Because he never wants us to turn away from him. Never. If anything, God wants us to draw closer to him. He wants us to have a better understanding of who he is and grow in our relationship. He never wants us to commit spiritual adultery. He wants us to be faithful to him in our covenant agreement. But you see, even if we were to stray a little bit and stray off course and come back and repent, God is patient, not wishing for anyone to perish, but that all come to repentance, even his children, so that they can receive the promise of eternal life. You know, when I think about this book, Hosea, and as we're going to be studying uh, throughout it for the couple of weeks, let's remember to be faithful to God at all times. We don't want to be the unfaithful wife in the context of Hosea. We want to be faithful to God in all that we do as his children. We don't want to give ourselves over to modern day idols, We don't want to backslide into sin. We want to always remain faithful to him. Why? Because he's faithful. He's faithful. He's loving. He's compassionate. You see, God usually, God never goes anywhere. When you really think about it, it's, it's we who stray away from him. We are the ones who stray away because we wanna live the way we want to live and do what we want to do when God knows what is best for his children. God knows what's best for each and every one of us here this evening. And that is faithfulness and loyalty to him and being loyal to him. Let us pray. Almighty God and Father, we pray that, that we will continue to stay faithful and loyal to you throughout our lives. Uh, Father, we know that this world can be tempting. Uh, there are a lot of things around us that could potentially lure us away from you. And I pray, Father God, that we will stand on your word, that we will stand on the promises that we, uh, that we have received from you. I pray that we will give heed to your word. I pray that we will not uh, fall victim to idolatry and wickedness. I pray that we will continue to stay faithful, humble, and obedient as your beloved children. May we continue to grow closer to you, Father God, each and every day as you, as you allow us to, to experience waking up in the morning. May we continue to live each day like it is our last. Father, may we continue to live each day pleasing to you. Uh, thank you so much for your son and for your word, and it is in his name that we pray, amen. If there is anyone here this evening who has been unfaithful to God, don't hesitate to come forward for prayer. If you have been unfaithful in service and in word, come forward and know that God is patient 
not willing for anyone to perish, but for everyone to continue to turn away from their sins. If there's anyone who has a need this evening, come forward as we stand and sing.